very lucky to have Victoria uh, with us to share her wonderful expertise on community living, community practices, and uh, from the perspective of being a creative. Just as an aside, before I hand over to Victoria, um, we're also running our morning creative practice calls at the moment. They started this week. If that feels like something anybody is interested in, you can just drop a message uh, to me in the chat and I can send some more details across afterwards. But they're basically a way to get you to connect back to your inner artist, your inner creative individual who is ready to express themselves who maybe hasn't been honored um, as well as you would have liked or maybe just because you're already a creative and an artist but you're not sharing or you don't have that accountability so they're run with Sylvie and as I said they started this week but you'd be able to join um, a week later for the final uh, seven sessions if you want to so with that said I will now hand out I was asked Stop talking and hand over to Victoria. I'll let, um, I'll let you introduce yourself more fully, if that's okay. And then feel free to continue on with your, with your talk. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, I'm really uh, glad that I got invited to talk about this topic that I really love, which is um, intentional co-living and specifically um, with the focus on building spaces for creative people. Um, so I'll tell a bit about myself, but before I do, um, I want to um, invite everyone while I'm introducing myself to think about any questions that you have, especially when it comes to challenges that you imagine that um, I might face or that you might face while designing communities around um, creators and creative types. Um, I find that when I talk to people about this, a lot of the times they have the same uh, sort of ideas and challenges in their head, but sometimes there's all kinds of new topics that come up. So I invite you to just put uh, any questions or ideas or thoughts about um, challenges or struggles um, when it comes to creatives in a community in the chat, and then I will I will talk about them a little bit later. Um, so about myself, my name is Victoria. I uh, consider myself a serial intentional community co-creator. And uh, that basically means that I've started a bunch of different intentional communities in different cities um, over the course of my adult life. Um, I grew up in Toronto and the first intentional community, hmm, it says my, my mic is rather low. I'll just speak a little bit louder. Is this a little bit better? Hopefully, great. So um, I started in, I, I, um, I'm not sure if everyone heard, but I had asked if anyone has a question about um, a challenge that um, we might face while designing communities for creative people, feel free to put it in the chat. So um, about me, I'm a serial intentional community co-creator, which means that I've, um, I've started communities in a number of different places over the course of my life. Um, I grew up in Toronto in Canada, and I started an intentional community there for professional performing artists who typically work on the road. And so they need a place to come back to when they are done touring, but they need a place that they can leave and not have to pay for um, when they're on the road working, um, doing shows. Um, so setting up a house for people um, with that as their career path uh, presented some unique challenges. Um, and I still have that home in Toronto and it's been running for about 13 years. Um, another um, uh, community that I built is after, after that kind of got established, I started traveling and um, starting to see other communities. And I went to San Francisco for several years uh, where I met my now husband, his name's Spar and he's on this call. And um, I was um, running an event venue there and uh, he had just started a, a community designed around vehicle dwelling. And it was a bit of an activism project uh, to sort of show the local government in the San Francisco Bay Area, what sort of amenities uh, could be provided for people who are living out of their cars or RVs. Um, 
And we ended up uh, building a pretty functional model together um, after we met for co-living and cohabiting um, based in a vehicle lifestyle. And then we uh, we got the opportunity to chat a lot with the city of Oakland's uh, planning and zoning department in order to demonstrate to them um, what was needed. And shortly thereafter, the city of Oakland launched a first of its kind um, um, open lot for safe vehicle dwelling, um, which um, which we were really proud that we got to be even some small part of. Um, after that, together, we started a co-living community in San Francisco, um, which was designed for creatives and makers and also queer people in San Francisco. And that ran um, very successfully and still exists today. And we finally decided to start a community together um, where we could own the property. And that's what brings us to where I am now, which is in a beautiful Victorian manor in a little town called Whitensville, Massachusetts. We're about an hour west of Boston. We're about 40 minutes from Providence, Rhode Island. And we're about a three and a half hour drive to New York City. So um, it's a good location near a lot of major airports and uh, there's a lot of exciting things to do that uh, as long as you can get to the train station, you can get you can get to some big cities. And, uh, and we have this beautiful uh, 25 acre, acre property here. And um, we decided to create together an intentional community for creative types. Um, we are basically a collaborative creator co-living community. So um, the, the premise of um, life here is that artists, makers, and other creators get together and um, collaborate together in a way that they wouldn't be able to otherwise if they were living uh, separately or alone. And um, that has presented its all sorts of its own unique challenges and struggles. And I'll talk about some of those and I'll talk about some of the solutions that we've come up with in the process. Um, but before I get too deep into um, that community itself, um, further on my own introduction, um, there are a few things that I do outside of this one community. Um, I'm a vocalist, and so that's my primary art form. Um, I've also been a graphic designer, and I really like that, but um, music is really my, my passion. So that's one of the things that I, I really like to do. And um, professionally, I've worked as a professional organizer, which is a really fun, um, it's a really fun uh, and very um, rewarding job for me. I get to go into people's homes and spaces and help them set up uh, in a way that they can be successful at whatever their goals are. And um, what I found um, is that my, my niche as a professional organizer is that I'm really good at organizing shared spaces uh, because of all of my experience in intentional communities and maker spaces. Um, there are there are challenges that are different. Um, if you're setting up a kitchen just for yourself or just for you and your life partner, it has a very different set of needs than a kitchen that's going to be interacted with by you know twenty residents and you know an ongoing series of guests. And so getting um, spaces organized where there can be um, many different people interacting with it uh, all the time is a really different uh, set of organizational challenges. And the other thing that I'm really passionate about is helping artists set up spaces where they can be creative. So uh, a lot of the times artists, especially crafts people, have a lot of materials and they have a lot of stuff and they have a lot of tools, but it can be pretty um, stifling to feel like you're drowning in your stuff and it doesn't put you in the mood to be creative at all. So I help people set up their spaces so that uh, when they walk into their studio, they can actually sit down and roll with that creative spark without feeling like they have to do all kinds of cleaning work just to just to get their ideas out. Um, so I think I think that's everything that you need to know about me. Um, as oh, and as a professional organizer, another thing that I do uh, typically is that I go into other people's homes and community spaces and I travel to do that sometimes. So sometimes I do extended stints um, in different countries, cities, overseas, where I go and I, 
I stay in people's homes in exchange for helping them set up longer term systems. Um, and so uh, right now I'm not doing that because I'm here building this project in Massachusetts, but in a, probably a number of years after things have really stabilized here, it, I will probably resume that sort of lifestyle. Um, so if anyone has any questions about me or anything, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, so I'm just going to read what uh, what Lauren wrote here about some of the some of the uh, challenges that it seems like creatives might face. So let's see, we have creatives can be highly sensitive. Um, aspects around shared spaces for creative practices, for example, someone might monopolize a space unintentionally where others can't use it. Yes, <laughs> yes, definitely that happens. So. Um, the thing about creatives can be highly sensitive is a really interesting um, is a really interesting one. When I was asking people in my life, what should I talk about at this talk? Um, a lot of people said the same thing and they're like, well, well, artists are more emotional than other people. And I actually don't think that's true. Like, I think I disagree with the premise here. I think that people can be highly sensitive and that living with people can be really challenging for people. Um, and it's not necessarily more so with artists, but it, it is really important to take um, people's emotions and emotional needs into account when building a community like this. And I'm just going to make a note that I'm going to get back to talking about people's emotional needs um, as a community leader and as a community member. Um, there's some more notes in the chat. Um, what are the same repeated needs that I see? What are the biggest obstacles I've encountered? Great. So, yeah. Um, sorry, sorry. I also just have another question off of what you were yeah, saying, which yeah. you, you may or may not be able to address, and, and it can obviously be done later. But what do you find that there's a stigma attached to individuals that have the label creative in kind of like mixed um, conscious communities? So where there's maybe a mix of individuals who would describe themselves not as a creative and those that would describe themselves as a creative is there like some stigma or interpretation that goes with being a creative that might impact things i haven't found this in my own experiences but i probably have a biased uh, sample because i'm a lifelong uh, community liver i've chosen this as a lifestyle and uh, the sorts of people that i attract into my life as a result of this are probably not a representative sample of the general North American population. Um, <laughs> but, but no, I haven't found a lot of stigma around um, the creative aspect. I have found stigma just about the premise of, of shared living. Um, this is a bit of a radical concept in parts of rural America, uh, which kind of makes me laugh, um, especially because I'm not a rural American myself. Um, uh, and I think um, I'm really happy to be in a place where I can lead by example and do something that seems radical, that just feels really uh, intuitive and normal for me. Um, so, so again, no, but I haven't found stigma around the creative aspects, which is, which is an interesting thought. Um, um, what I have found that's been a primary concern for trying to build a space around artists is financial instability. And that's because um, this is a very like capitalist society that we live in. And in order to, um, it's almost set up where there's all these factors working against creative people, where in order to really take the time to pursue your craft and to work on um, creating works of art, it's at the expense of being able to give all of that time to to a job a lot of the time and so um american society is not set up in a way that's particularly favorable uh to people without without jobs there's no health care here which is a bit of a culture change for me coming from canada and and probably for people who grew up in europe and other parts of the world uh where that's just something we're lucky enough to have um so even when people arrive here um with with a certain level of financial stability and safety net it something can change that can very easily set derail that and so having um 
having measures in place to help people who who fall into a place where they're struggling financially, where they're not immediately going to lose their home, um, and there isn't this feeling of immediate housing insecurity has been uh, really important for us. And then also, we're trying to attract artists to this relatively small and unknown town. Um, and not all of the artists who are really talented and skilled have the financial resources to, you know, take a year off from whatever it is that they work um, to, in order to come here and do a residency and make art with us. So, um, so, so that was something that it took me a little bit while, uh, a little bit of a while to figure out how to address. And what I came up with um, as a sort of um, balance between the people who are here who can afford to pay rent and the people who are here who would like to be contributing but don't have the financial means to do so um, is that I developed something I call the volunteer guest program. And we got this idea through websites like uh, World Packers, where we've been signed up for a long time and people from all over the world come and stay with us. And we dedicated a number of our what would have been private bedrooms and turned them into hostel style bunk bed rooms. And we, we developed a program that right now enables people to volunteer here for between 10 and 15 hours a week. Um, in ex and we also provide meals in exchange for, um, for somewhere to sleep and somewhere to create and somewhere to be part of the community. And this has been um, a real game changer for us as a community because it brings in um, this like artistic vibrancy and cultural diversity that wouldn't have been there if we had only been looking for people who who wanted to live locally and um, who had the financial means to pay for a private room. Um, and some of our most vibrant and exciting times socially have been when there have been guests from all over the world and all over the continent staying with us and contributing together. Um, uh, another challenge, and that sort of ties into another challenge that we had, which was that we had this vision that this would be a collaborative community for creators. Um, but then when we actually started and we got all these creators together, it wasn't immediately intuitive how to get them to collaborate with each other. You know, we had someone who does video production and we had someone who makes jewelry. And, you know, aside from maybe making a video about their jewelry, there isn't like an obvious like ongoing overlap for these two sorts of people. And and so we found we didn't really have initially a critical mass of any one type of creator that made it obvious. It wasn't, you know, we had someone whose background was in theater, but we didn't have enough people whose background was in theater to make a whole theatrical production. So um, this was something we, we were trying to figure out, how do we foster a collaborative environment for people? And what we came up with is um, actually one of our residents, his name is Sam Perry, and his background was in theater. He's also, he's got so many talents. He does fire spinning. He makes um, fire marionettes. So he he works with marionette puppets while they're on fire. Um, and, and he's an excellent puppet maker of all sorts. And uh, a really a, a really good creative problem solver. Um, he came up with this vision that we should do a annual haunted house and our house really lends itself to this sort of thing because it's a big spooky looking Victorian mansion um, that's really dark colors and and it just looks like the sort of place you would imagine would be haunted. Um, so um, another thing that's kind of neat about a haunted house is that it's a place where everyone is welcome when when people people who are building a haunted house you know there you know there's no oh you have too many tattoos so you can't work here kind of requirements like it's it's very like um embracing of people with very um counterculture lifestyles and um there's another really interesting thing about the medium of horror yeah, where it's similar to comedy in that it allows people to speak truth to power because there are a lot of really uncomfortable truths that people don't want to hear about or think about a lot of the time. But through horror as a medium, we can we can talk about really, really um, ugly and grotesque things that are happening in the world 
and and remind people that these are problems that we actually need to solve. So um, so it works on a lot of different levels um, to be a, a good cultural fit here. And um, the idea that Sam had, because we're still renovating parts of the interior of the manor and we weren't quite ready to do an event of that scope inside, is that we would do a drive-through haunted house with um, an accompanying radio broadcast with a local FM transmitter. And we would uh, have everybody who arrives to do the drive-through uh, turn on their car stereo to our own radio broadcast and then drive through and see all this different, you know, manufactured paranormal activity uh, along the course of our whole property, which has an in, and then there's a few loops and then there's an out. And um, what was really, really good about this um, was that it provided an opportunity for literally everyone who wanted to get involved, whether they lived here or not, to contribute something creatively to this project. Um, we made it an immersive theater project. So we, we had a writer come in who wrote us a script. We had voice actors record it. We had a sound designer um, record it. Uh, and edit and put it together and make original compositions for it. And it sounded like a believable War of the World style radio broadcast explaining a bunch of horrific and paranormal things. And all of the artists built scenes and sets and costumes and works of performance art and sculpture and video installations, all accompanying the theme of the story of the universe that was called cultivated. And um, we did this as a proof of concept. Oh, we just wrapped it up a little over a week ago. And it worked extremely well. And it was, um, it's something that I think we will probably replicate every year that we remain here. And the reason is because um, it's the sort of thing that if done well, should take an entire year to put together. And it's the sort of thing that really, literally everyone with any interest, skill set, um, is able to contribute to because it's so versatile in its um, in in the way that it's put together. Uh, it, it, there's you can keep adding to it and it can keep growing. And if one part is missing, it's not a big deal. You know, if somebody if somebody gets overwhelmed and drops out, the the rest of the production still goes on. Um, and so that's that's actually been. A bit of a game changer culturally for us since that since that idea was proposed and since we since we did the pilot project this year because now instead of this idea that we had that everybody here would be collaborating creatively um, we actually have something for them to focus on uh, and collaborate creatively and it, uh, it it really some of the people here who I feel like were previously having struggling to feel inspired. Uh, were able to connect to this and feel inspired. Um, and and it solved um, a lot of our like internal community um, struggles just by having a project for everybody to focus on, um, which, which was really fun and really great. Um, I'm going to talk about um, for sure, and you brought this up, Lauren, uh, the idea of um, staying organized in physical spaces and what happens when somebody takes over a space uh, even unknowingly um, and then makes it so that other people can't use it. Um, yeah, this, this actually happens all the time. <laughs> I'm, and I think it happens even in places that aren't, um, that aren't just for creatives. Um, but it's happened a lot with the creatives here. Um, and one of the things that we're lucky enough to have is right now we have more space than people for sure. So when things like this do happen, there's enough of a buffer that we can spot it and work with them to, to, to find other options. But at the same time that itself creates the problem because people see that there's so much space, how could we possibly fill it all? So we can just take, you know, as much of it as we need. Um, so the main concern hasn't actually been the space as much as it's been how this creates um, social divides between people. Um, it, even spaces that weren't actually needed by someone 
uh, still created a sore spot for some people. You know, why does so and so get to use all that space? And I asked first, and I was told I couldn't use all that space, but they just went and did it. What? Why is this okay? You know, so uh, most of the problems have have really been about solving disputes and feelings of you know like hostility or resentment toward between members and between the artists here um so so it's led to things like um creating very clear rules and expectations about use of space um understanding which areas need to be cleaned on what sorts of time frames um within the manner itself this is also an event venue and people film here and there are public events several times a week. So there's a very clear understanding that if you make a mess in the manor, it's going to get like shoveled away within 24 hours if, if you're not on top of it um, because, because somebody else is going to need the space and it'll be clear who did it. But there's lots of other spaces where, you know, you can you can set something up and it can stay for a couple of weeks and it's fine because it's not it's not necessarily blocking anyone. Um, we have um, pretty strict labeling policies and I got this idea from makerspaces. Um, uh, particularly if 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 things are left lying around and they're not labeled. We don't know what they are. We don't know whose they are, and we don't know why they're there. So by default, they're communal, or you know they're lost and found. And there are labels available for people to use to identify their things. And we ask people to not only put their name on things, but to also put the intention for the thing. Um, so one of the uh, things you might say is like, you know, I am I am a conga drum. I live in the music room, you know, and it doesn't actually even matter whose drum it is, but then everyone who finds it knows whether it's in the right spot or not and knows where to clean it up to. And it's not just moving around in circles uh, while everyone asks, what is this and where, why did we get it? Um, and so sometimes putting your name on something, it's unclear whether that means that it's for communal use, or if it means if you find this, please return it to my personal bedroom and no one should touch it. So communicating that by labeling an item um, resolves a lot of conflicts. And that's something I try to teach people. It's in our onboarding documents before you move in here. Uh, it's a, how can I prepare to move in here? Get ready to label your stuff. <laughs> so um, that's really helpful. Um, and Sometimes including dates is really helpful as well. Like, you know, this mess will be cleaned up by Saturday, whatever the calendar date is. And then um, we also have a Discord for online comms. So if something's really unclear and people need to know, there's there are channels for people to take photos and post. And um, it's not a foolproof system. People, people make mistakes. People aren't necessarily good at labeling their things or... Or, or, or they just forget and drop a thing and wander off. And it it's just about the more people know what the expectations are, the more we're able to support each other, uh, hold each other accountable in like constructive ways and also um, also help, um, you know, if, if we know that somebody is susceptible to forgetting, reminding them before they leave the room, oh, are, did you leave anything down here? Uh, oh, there's no note on this. What should we do with it? And that kind of thing. And uh, it'll never be perfect uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but it can definitely be a lot less, um, you know, it doesn't have to be hostile and it doesn't have to be um, a sore spot for people if, if the expectations are clear from the beginning. Um, it's more than just stuff also. Uh, a lot of arts create odors. <laughs> and so... Even um, like 3D printing and um, working with resin and certain types of painting, uh, these can create a lot of um, smells and stuff that bother a lot of the people that are here. You know, there's a craft room that's really close to the kitchen and, and sometimes there's fumes wafting out of one that really conflict with what's wafting out of the other. And so um, it, it's more than just the stuff that takes up space um the you know odors are kind of like an invisible way of um 
of causing like um space conflicts with people and uh again the solution has been mostly like defining what sorts of materials are okay to use indoors or outdoors or in certain areas and why and it's again not perfect sometimes people don't realize um but i've also noticed this happens in even in non-artistic environments you know like sometimes people don't realize a hairspray uh you know has a smell that could bother somebody or um or who knows um um i'm trying to think if there's anything else that's like specific to um specific to stuff um especially in some of my other in some of my other spaces but um not the ones that are here um there's there's something there, this is an important differentiation there are community homes for creators that are private homes where creators live and then there are community homes for creators that are sort of also public event venues where creators live but also creators visit and the general public visits and there's a public presence for it and these two types of spaces present different styles of life and different types of challenges um being in the public presence with one's housing is a really really different sort of uh living experience than than having your home be private in my toronto house for the professional performing artists the people who live there are extremely private they have a public persona but they'd never want any of their fans to know where they lived and and they want to keep their home life and their personal life completely separate from any of their public works. Um, but in a place like this, um, here at Massachusetts, at a state of mind, the the whole facility is open to the public all the time. And we have a website, and people can have bios on the website. And there's there's press being written and featuring different people's art and this is this is a very different um, type of home living. Um, not everyone's comfortable with it. Not everyone's on the website. It's not required, but there's um, there's still people coming through through the space, and everyone understands that before they get here. Um, it means that if you leave stuff lying around in a common space, in literally anyone who doesn't even know what our rules are might find it and interact with it. So that's also a personal deterrent for people, uh, you know, if they're particularly sensitive about people using their stuff, that they don't leave it where, you know, they know that the public is going to be coming through on a tour or for a workshop, you know, later that day. And so uh, that itself is, um, it sort of helps it sort of helps keep the mess contained to people's more private areas. Um, in terms of the um, this idea that artists are more sensitive or more emotional than others that I don't necessarily agree with, I think humans are just sensitive and emotional sometimes. And that when you get a bunch of adults and you try to get them living together in the same house, it can, you know, all kinds of, things we see each other not only at our best but we see each other at our worst right and sometimes there can be external pressures that affect everyone at once and it can be everyone at their worst all at the same time and it can be it, it can be really trying um I've chosen this lifestyle so um I'm prepared for that and I know what it's like and I apologize when I'm not my best self to people and I, I try to work on not not doing that too often um but it's um it, what is interesting is that when different people are getting differently recognized in the public image for their artistic works or not that's where i found that the emotional concerns are that are unique to artists because you know if 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 somebody cho chooses to write about an art exhibition that we did in the local paper and they picked two or three of the artists here to feature and then just ignored the others this can cause a lot of internal disputes in, in, in a household because um especially if the same people are getting picked and favored over and over again um 
it, it can make people feel small and insignificant and it can cause like a lot of tensions that you wouldn't normally find in just like a regular living space that wasn't also, you know, a public arts event venue um, full of full of people creating art all the time. So so that's been a really interesting one to navigate the emotions behind because um, it's a little bit like um, running a workshop or, or a PR workshop for artists and and trying to, you know, we're still at the point where we're trying to get the word out. And if anyone writes any press about it at all, it, it's very helpful. Um, so so trying to get more people involved in, um, in trying to generate um, press for themselves if they're interested is something that I'm really interested in working with the artists here on. But, um, but some people have more experience with this than others, and they, they come into it with a different skill set. And... Um, it's not one that I've solved yet. Um, it was it was something I didn't really think about in advance, but that's definitely been one of the emotional struggles here. Um, I'm trying to think if there's um, if there's anything else that I wanted to talk about before I sort of like open up the floor to questions. Um, I think I think I covered it. I'm looking at my notes here, and uh, all of the challenges and then the solutions that we implemented are here. Um, what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to put in the chat the the website of um, me as a professional organizer, me as a vocalist, this house, which is called a state of mind, um, which has this volunteer guest program. So if you're looking for somewhere to come and co-create with people, um, we'll we'll put you up and you can learn about how that works on our website. But I'd really love to know um, from people and open up the floor to questions and discussion, um, even if it's not a question for me, if there's something you want to ask the whole group, um, go right ahead. Um, and yeah, thanks for listening to me talk about this. Like I said, this is one of my favorite subjects and something I'm really passionate about. So I'm glad I'm glad to have an audience. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Victoria. So yes, does anyone have any questions from that wealth of information that Victoria has just shared? I've got a few, but I will hold back to see if anyone else wants to moon. Do you have something you want to offer? And John, I think you've unmuted yourself as well. So feel oh, free I to jump in. To, um, thank Victoria and say that that was really, really interesting. And I'm definitely going to look um, into your house because it sounds really fascinating. Um, yeah, I'm not in the US, unfortunately, but if I was, I would definitely be interested in visiting. And I can't wait to hear more about your next Halloween um, extravaganza because that sounded really really cool <laughs> thank you yeah I wonder if with the your Halloween extravaganza if you're able to share any kind of videos you've got of that photos even some clips of the audio we can like tie it into the blog post and kind of like also share that um more widely as well because that might be quite useful for for, for some individuals thank you yeah it's so soon after the event that I don't even actually have consolidated um media mm -hmm. assets for that yet but I'll I'll put them together sometime in the next few months but I did include the website in the chat for mm -hmm. the haunted house it's called Frightensville which is a play on the name of the town that we're in which is called Whitensville. nice yeah nice perfect thank you John did you have a question yes well thank you so much Victoria it's fabulous to uh, tap into your rich experience and uh, I actually have a meeting tomorrow, 10 a.m. with the local town hall <laughs> regarding an, an old farm property uh, that actually belongs to my uh, family-in-law, but is um, kind of a, a perfect location for a, a similar community concept. Uh, I, I was curious just in terms of the balance because, um, so I'm based in France and there are some um, quite well-developed um, government support and even European Union um, financing that's possible. A huge criteria, however, is impact on the local community. I just wondered how has that been for you in your past experiences, and sort of the balance of creating um, a value for the, for, for the artists in their own work. And um, I can really see that being attractive for artists to, to have a base. But that balance between what you might sort of have to preempt or, I don't know, um, sort of promote for a local, uh, um, local engagement. Have you, have you had to sort of engage with that? Do you see it as a potential? 
Yeah, well, that's a great question. And I'm going to just say up front that the honest answer is that I'm not doing a very good job of that. Um, but um, I'll explain what some of the struggles have been. Um, th the biggest struggle is that I only have so many hours in a day and there's only so much I can do. And I haven't actually made that my primary focus yet. But um, I'm also new to the region. So I don't have any of my own social network here. And I, I'm coming into a cultural landscape that was unfamiliar terrain for me. So, so it already wasn't working in my favor from the get go. And I've also, I've personally only been here since February of this year. Um, although my husband and I bought the property just about two years ago, two years and a week ago, um, he was here um, working on it before, before I got here full time. So, so I'm even newer uh, to the region than everybody else who's been here. Um, so, so um, one of the next things that I'm going to be focusing on is investigating what sort of funding is available locally and how we can do a better job of contributing to the local community. What, what I'm doing, I feel like should be exciting to the local community because I'm offering tons of free arts programming and uh, pay what you can donation based event space available to the local community but i don't yet understand what the local market needs or what the, you know the political mindset is and what the social what what the social needs are um of of the people nearby so i'm providing what i would want but it's not necessarily aligned with what the community wants so this is this is a whole area that i have yet to explore and as as people um that their locals trickle in they offer more insight for me it's and it's also very divisive what we're doing because um although mm. um it doesn't feel very radical for me which i mentioned at the beginning of the call you know adults living together great like what a great use of shared resources is my philosophy on this for some people that's a very strange concept and they say things well you know like but you're just doing that until you like find a husband or right and then you'll then you'll get married and live and oh no 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 we did that already this is how we chose to live our lives right and this is close their mind right <laughs> so um so i'm still sort of learning um people don't understand what we do and they ask me you know when i go into town they're like is everybody naked i'm like literally nobody <laughs> is naked and they're like really and i'm like yeah sorry to disappoint <laughs> right so yes. like i don't know <laughs> getting to know the local community is is hard um and i want to because i i think um Half of the yeah. half of the people who've reached out to us, you know, are just like, wow, you're doing something really exciting in this place. I never thought anything like this would happen. And I'm so stoked. How do I get involved? And sometimes we just get hate mail, like get out of our heritage town. What are you doing here? <laughs> you hippies. Right. So, really? so um, it is wow. what it is. Yeah. Um, I wish I had a, a better answer for you, but maybe if you figure it out, you can tell me. <laughs> <laughs> it's right at the very beginning so this is just uh yes we'll would love to stay in touch yeah mm -hmm. thanks thanks for the thanks for the reply yeah you're welcome um i have a, a question victoria around the so um kind of a little footnote to that if um if i may do, do, do you Go ahead. No, go for it, John. Finish what you were saying. I'll, I'll, I'll come back later, Lauren. You go ahead. Okay, only if you're sure. Um, so I have a question around your volunteer guest program, Victoria. Can you like just talk talk well, to us a little bit more about? Victoria, do you have um? a reference of similar communities to yours in, in North America and internationally. Did you hear that, Victoria? He I asked, um, do you like... have a reference yeah. of um, similar communities to you in North America and internationally? 
Yeah, I don't have, you know, an exhaustive list by any means, but um, I was a, a member of an international um, intentional community network that started in the San Francisco Bay Area, originally under the name the Embassy Network, although I think they took on the name an accidental megastructure. And uh, that gave me a lot of connections to other communities building similar things. I, ha I don't have a lot of personal contacts here in Massachusetts, although I do know that there are a lot of community spaces in Boston uh, and also in New York City and probably in Providence too. I'm just not, um, I'm not totally uh, in the network. I know that there's um, international community websites where we're listed and where people reach out to us sometimes and also conferences and stuff for international communities. And again, I'll get to them eventually. There's only so many things I can focus on at once. So for my own sanity, I pick, uh, you know, two or three areas of focus at a time. And I'll, I'll get around to networking with those communities, but I haven't, um, I have, I haven't made that my focus uh, in a little while. Um, yeah, no, that I mean that makes sense. You, like you said, you're only one person can only create so much um, at one at one time. Um, so, are you okay if I ask you a quick question about your volunteer guest program? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to talk about I, it. Yeah, I mean, I'd be really interested to know the kinds of roles that people would sort of volunteer to take up, fulfill the tasks, and also, you know, like more logistically, is it? there's a minimum commitment of a certain amount of weeks or, or you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, 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 it's less structured than I think some people want it to be, but um, I'm a pretty laissez-faire manager. Um, what I really, really like to do is that after people have gotten here and they've gotten acclimated to how you know we interact with cleaning the dishes and using the kitchen and communal food and laundry and all of the little things that can be a little bit of a learning curve for people depending on their familiarity with shared spaces or not um i so that i'm not overwhelming anyone once they feel like a little bit grounded in the space i like to meet with them and figure out what it is that they like to do and what it is they want to learn and how they can help and then um, I usually tailor jobs based on what people's areas of interest are. And this doesn't end up being balanced across everyone who participates because sometimes people um, are able to make a really big contribution with a very like focused uh, uh, skill set in very little time. And sometimes people, you know, it takes them a lot of time um, but they're really happy to do that because it's something that they're passionate about. And um, I, I try to give everybody who volunteers a sense that they've contributed to something greater. You know, even if you just ask somebody to sweep the floor, it's a very boring job. But if you explain that, you know, we just had this renovation crew come in, they created a whole bunch of plaster dust, and we have this vision of turning this space into this arts hub, and that there's going, we're going to be offering these workshops and we're trying to build them but we have all this construction dust in the way then it's a little bit easier to picture why you would be sweeping the floor and why that would be exciting to someone right and still even if they're like no i really just never want to go anywhere near any dust then it's totally fine i can find them something else to do and and part of the reason i'm able to do that is because there's an infinite amount of stuff that needs to be done and there's no limit to uh, if somebody has an area of interest that's literally anything, I can give it to them. Eventually, maybe I'll make it more structured and be a little bit more strict about the rules. I do kind of ask people, it, it's kind of an honor system. We say work between 10 to 15 hours a week doing directed tasks. We have a Discord where we list uh, ongoing tasks that need to be done. We have like general maintenance tasks that need to be done that we have a list of as well. So if somebody, it doesn't have to be blocked waiting for my instructions. But, you know, people who are self-starters and who really want to get involved, there's all sorts of ways for them to do so. And then um, if they want to extend their stays and we saw, you know, they were really comfortable here and they, they, they contributed a lot, that'll influence how people feel about that versus... You know, if somebody came here and they did literally nothing, 
and they just hung out for a week, you know, chilling with people in the common spaces. There's value in that too, because it's making people feel good and having a good time and being an exciting world traveler, telling stories about life on the road is really cool for the ambiance here, but I might not invite that person to come back and volunteer. I'm not going to get them in trouble. I'm not going to say, oh, you didn't do anything for a week. But, uh, you know, I'm also just going to remind them these are the expectations. If you don't do them, oh, well, you know, uh, I got better things to do than get mad at people. <laughs> so, no, so no, I can see that. Um, but, but we really value, like, most of the people who come here understand what we're up against. Like, maintaining <laughs> a house in a property like this is a huge amount of work. We're all volunteers. We're all, like, stretched to our absolute limits right now. And people usually see that, and they're like, oh, here's an area I can actually help, and I can actually make a difference. And then they do, and it, it's helped propel our project forward in ways we wouldn't have been able to do on our own. And and that's what we're, you know, if if somebody is excited about coming here and helping contribute, that's usually the best place um, for people to yeah. be arriving from. Amazing. Yeah, and I think you've really highlighted a key point of like action, but even in the sense that like even really small actions can have such a profound impact in like the long run or on the bigger vision. And it's like really important not to disregard the kind of everyday things or the smaller things um, and assume that they don't actually have value because often they're the things that bring the most value um, to a community. Yeah, absolutely. Like um, if there's a bunch of skilled laborers here and you're, you are making them dinner, you know, that's, that's a huge contribution, especially if it's a good dinner, you know, that keeps everyone fed and happy and healthy and able to work and, you know, able to focus on the task at hand. Um, you know, it's not a small job or trivial job at all to feed a whole house full of people when there's, you know, 20 or 30 people that need to be fed. Um, and, and that's something that we've been the most grateful um, when travelers come through, if they're like, well, I don't know how to build anything and I don't know how to, I don't know how to clean anything, but boy, can I make a nice soup? <laughs> like, great. That's, that's fantastic. Right. Because everybody needs to eat. Um, and, uh, and like I said, there's always something, there's always something for people who want to get involved. There's just so much, so many areas. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm mindful that we, we're coming or we've come up to time, but I just want to check if anyone else has any final questions. Um, people can either unmute and ask or drop it in the chat if they're not able to. Um, John, thank you. He's Yeah, I guess you can read in the chat. But yeah, it's annoying, frustrating when connection keeps dropping, isn't it? It's one of those one of those things. Um, but the replay will be available um, within the next sort of week. So you can always um, catch up on that John if there's anything that you missed um yeah does anybody else have any any final questions or anything else they'd like to say no okay Victoria would you like to to offer any final final thoughts or Moon says that was really interesting thank you so much oh thank you this was great. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Um, it's, it's great to talk about these things. If anyone has any questions at all, feel free to reach out. Uh, my contact info is on any of those mm. websites. Uh, so you, finding me should be easy. And um, if you know anyone who might be interested in traveling through, uh, send them our way. Um, we yeah. have lots of space cool. for guests and uh, there's always a vibrant group of travelers here. Uh, helping yeah, wonderful yeah, yeah. yeah we'll, we'll put those um we'll put those uh websites up on the when we update the blog post with the community call so if anybody watches it and then is like i want to get in touch they can do so really easily so on behalf of life itself thank you so much for giving up the time um and sharing yeah sharing this really beautiful experience with us and um yeah hopefully we can all connect again soon all Take right. care, Thank everyone. So Bye. Everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.